Good afternoon, and welcome back to the breakout stage for another exciting session brought to you by Giovanna Lemes of Mixpanel on using data to build better products and grow faster. Steps for designing a product analytics strategy. Giovanna is a strategy and operations manager for the customer success team at Mixpanel. She has a passion for technology and has worked in Silicon Valley for the past decade. In her previous roles as implementation manager, Giovanna has helped dozens of clients leverage software solutions to achieve their business goals. Please welcome Giovanna. Hello everyone, good afternoon. I hope you're all enjoying this year's Startup Grind conference. My name is Giovanna Lemus and I'm here today to talk to you all about a topic that I absolutely love, which is product analytics. More specifically, using data to build better products and grow faster steps for designing a product analytics strategy. Before I start, I wanted to quickly introduce myself. Again, my name is Giovanna Lemus. I am a customer success strategy and operations manager at Mixpanel, which is a product analytics company. I joined Mixpanel a little over two years ago now, um, initially as an implementation manager, helping our customers identify their metrics and KPIs and really get started with their product analytics program. Um, I absolutely love data and technology, which is why I've been in the tech industry for um, about the last 10 years or so. Um, but enough about me, we do have quite a bit to cover today. Um, so on the agenda for today, we'll get started by um, going into getting a quick introduction of product analytics. Then we'll talk about the importance of having an analytics strategy in place. Then we'll dive a little bit deeper into how we can actually go about designing an analytics strategy. We'll then cover some best practices for identifying metrics and KPIs. And time permitting, we'll go through a sample exercise at the end. So without further ado, let's get into product analytics. Um, one of the first questions we get is what is product analytics and how is it different from traditional analytics? And almost every company in the world today has a marketing analytics tool. Um, usually it's Google Analytics um, or, you know, just something similar. Um, but essentially marketing analytics helps you analyze data from marketing efforts. Um, it gets you data around um, traffic and acquisition. Um, it really helps you answer questions around where users are coming from, um, you know, how many site visitors you have and so forth. And in today's worlds of consumer empowerment and software as a service, the biggest battle we find is keeping people's attention and increasing engagement and retention, which together increase their lifetime value. So product analytics specializes in really understanding how people engage with your product and why they stay or go. So as we can see here, we can get an understanding of what a user's first week of engagement with your product um, upon signing up was like. Um, you can also um, understand impact of certain feature launches on um, usage of your product and so forth. Um, with product analytics, we can essentially start to get better insight into user acquisition, their journeys, and how they engage with your product. So again, as we can see here, you go from understanding how many visitors you get to really understanding how they're engaging with your product, um, you know, who's going to update um, or who's going to upgrade within your product, um, is, it, is your product getting stickier, and so forth. Some other popular solutions out there and available are BI tools and legacy analytics. Um, if you're familiar with any of these tools, you know that analysis on these data is incredibly painful without a tool spe specifically designed for it. And essentially, there are a lot of resources on the market that you can give your data team to work with, right? So. Um, and as we can see here, all of those different resources and different um, types of analytics have their strengths and trade-offs. 
So BI, for example, is extremely powerful for business reporting, um, asking revenue related questions with SQL, um, but it does require technical expertise and more time. Um, some of the product usage specific questions um, are more are a bit more difficult to, to answer with BI tools. On the other hand, uh, marketing analytics helps analyze traffic, ad campaigns. Um, however, it is harder to answer complex engagement questions around product usage. And product analytics can help you run simple and powerful analyses, really democratizing access to data for all teams while empowering sophisticated insights and enabling um, data enrichment. With product analytics, essentially iteration is key. And as we can see here in this, in this um, loop is you start by asking questions, exploring the data and creating hypotheses. Then you can start to build and ship high impact um, improvements in your product um, and then really learn from results. And again, this, you know, you, we see that this is a loop here because you really want to keep innovating, um, iterating and um, repeating that that cycle. Um, but essentially with product analytics, you can um, what it does is it surfaces a lot of what about X um, with regards to, you know, the different questions around your product. Um, what did your users do before, during, after, and so forth? Um, but so now that we get a, now that we have a little bit of a better understanding of product analytics, um, how do you actually get started with tracking product activity and measuring the right metrics and KPIs? As an implementation manager, uh, one of the most frequent questions I used to get was, where do I start? Um, and without having a clear indication for where to start, um, some product managers take the route of tracking everything. Now, um, with so many potential metrics out there, you know, how do we know which ones actually matter to our businesses? And or rather to our business. And if you find yourself struggling to, to answer these questions, you are most definitely not alone. Um, in a survey of nearly 500 product leaders across the globe conducted by product school um, in 2020, only 50% um, of those of the product um, manager leaders interviewed felt that they are unable to quickly get answers to product questions. And only 38% of them feel that they can effectively measure their top metrics. Now, often, you know, we find that companies will have an abundance of data, but that doesn't always translate to insightful data. And this can be due in large part to the lack of having an analytic strategy. So one of the, the key ways to mitigate that is to define and have in place an analytic strategy. Essentially, following a product analytics strategy helps ensure that your data is streamlined and focused. Um, the last thing you want is to end up rich in data, but poor in insights. And so now that we have a better understanding that tracking everything, or hopefully we have an understanding, a shared understanding that tracking everything is not the answer, how do we actually go about um, identifying what you should be measuring, right? And that's where, uh, you know, actually designing a an analytic strategy really comes in. Um, one of the first things to note is that there's not a single one size fits all approach. Um, over the years, we at Mixpanel have partnered closely with hundreds of companies to help develop their analytic strategies. And what we found is that there simply isn't a single set of metrics that works for everyone. Um, businesses and products are all unique. Um, they have different goals um, based on different stages, based on different ambitions. Um, so there's not a single one size fits all, right? So how do we actually develop an analytics solution, an analytics strategy solution that is scalable, yet um, that is unique for your business? Um, and that's where different frameworks come in. 
There are a number of different frameworks out there. Um, some of those include the ones that we see here. We have Pirate Metrics, which um, really is the, the R um, funnel that we see here. It focuses on acquisition, activation, retention, revenue, or referral. Then we have Growth Loops, which focus on self reinforcing systems. Um, retention, engagement, acquisition, monetization. Um, and then finally, we have um, Google's user-centric heart metrics here, which um, stand for happiness, engagement, adoption, retention, and task success. Um, a, another framework out there um, that I personally really like is Mixpanel's focus metric framework. Um, this framework was built in-house by Mixpanel's director of, of analytics strategy, and it is designed to capture all stages of a customer lifecycle. So we start at the top with the focus metric, um, and the focus metric should really be your top priority. Um, it shouldn't be your sole priority, um, you know, it, essentially um, improving the focus metric should not be accomplished at the expense um, of harming other KPIs, but it should definitely be a top of mind um, metric. From there, we go into what we call our level one metrics. Um, and as you can see here, they're broken out into five different categories, which are reach, activation, engagement, retention, and business specific. Um, reach is essentially the total number of people who have used your product in a, in a recent time period. So reach essentially refers to the users who have the potential to become activated, to become engaged with your product, to keep coming back and using your product, um, and so forth. Um, activation is essentially a foundational step that primes a new user um, to become an active user. So we recommend tracking um, activation um, as a percentage of users who have become activated. So um, the time it takes um, for users to become activated or um, as a key milestone. So for example, um, Facebook has the famous um, seven friends in 10 days. Um, and um, we'll get into all of these in a bit more detail later. But so activation, again, really refers to that foundational um, step that primes your user um, to, to becoming active with your product. Um, engagement should account to the frequency and the cadence of the actions that your users are, are completing. So you should be looking not only at the breadth of engagement, right, but also the depth of engagement. So not only are your users engaging with your product, but how engaged are they with your product, right? So not only um, the breadth of activity um, and actions that they can take within your product, but how frequently, how often um, they're, they're taking those actions. Um, then we have retention. Retention is essentially the metric that um, shows whether your product has staying power. So are your users coming back um, continuously to your product? And then finally, we have anything that is um, business specific, um, and that is any metric that is specific to your business or um, that falls outside of any of the metrics that we've um, discussed so far. Um, a great example, this is definitely one of my favorites, a great example of a business specific metric is positive churn. So um, if you think, for example, of dating apps, um, their end goal is for people to actually find meaningful relationships and leave and, um, you know, get rid of the app. So if they find that users are leaving the app and are no longer coming back because they have um, you know, reach their goal, then that may actually be a positive metric, right? And so that is an example of what a, a positive churn um, would be. Um, essentially, what I typically, what I used to, how I used to guide my customers was, um, if you're unsure about a metric, really ask yourself, why? Why are you tracking this? What would you do um, differently within your product because of that piece of data? Right. So really always ask yourself um, these questions. 
Um, but so then, so we cover the, the focus metric, we have our level one metrics, and then we have level two metrics. And level two metrics are essentially more specific, um, broken down versions of your um, level one metrics. And as we can see here, they should really be driving um, those L1s and focus metrics. Uh, one example of how you can slice your data um, and segment it is by um, the three different sections that we can see here, one of them being um, user slices, which really focuses on, you know, your the user location, um, user type, um, acquisition source, and so on. Then we have the activity slice, which um, is based on, you know, different devices they're using, app versions, or even specific um, features that they're using, right? So are they beta testers? Are they um, using different product versions? And then finally, we have the cohort slice. And the cohort slice really allows you to break your, um, your data up by um, different types of user cohorts. So as we can see here, a couple of examples would be um, different personas, um, your power users versus a dormant user, um, user tenure, so whether they're new, existing, um, and so forth. So um, what we found um, in, in that same or rather in a different report, this was in the 2021 State of Product Analytics report, um, only 17% of product managers surveyed didn't segment their data at all. So in other words, um, you know, over two thirds of them and um, actually 70% of them do so by, by user persona. So really leveraging that cohort slice. But so in other words, um, we can see that data segmentation is um, highly important um, and frequently used by, um, by product managers. And as you start to define your metrics, it's also really important to keep in mind um, your top level organizational goals. So what we find is that organizations at different stages of maturity may naturally want to focus on different types of metrics. So as we can see here, for example, um, early stage companies may focus more on, um, or they may have as a goal, um, confirming product market fit, right? So as a result, they may be focusing on metrics around activation and um, engagement, especially deep usage um, from early adoptions, um, and then retention. So are users actually coming back, right? So in order to understand um, or get to that goal of understanding product market fit, um, you would be focusing on certain metrics over others. Um, as you start to transition over to, you know, more of a mid-stage um, level, the goal then becomes really, or one of the many goals could be, um, you know, scaling the product. So then at this point, you're probably looking at um, different metrics. Um, reach, for example, are you reaching a wider audience at this point? Um, how many new users um, are, you, are you getting into your product? Is your product growing, right? Is it scaling? Um, engagement is still something you, you would want to keep um, an eye on. And at this point, you start to look at monthly active usage, um, retention, and so forth. Um, and then finally, once you're at that late stage, you're, we're really talking about scaling the business, right? And so some of the metrics we're looking at here could be um, monthly active usage, um, annual revenue per user, um, long-term value, um, all of those different types of, of metrics. But so as we can see, having an analytic strategy really helps you ensure that the data you're, collect you're collecting and the metrics you're analyzing are aligned with the goals and objectives of your business. So in other words, an analytic strategy is and should be goal-oriented. But so once we have a framework in mind, um, you know, there are definitely some best practices that you'll want to follow when defining your, your metrics and, and KPIs. Um, 
essentially what we found is that having too many goals can be just as ineffective as having none. Right. So as you start and continue to iterate on your metrics, um, we've essentially set up a, a number of principles that we recommend having, you know, um, our, our customers follow. But if you're familiar with smart goals, this is essentially our take on that. Um, this is what we call the four T, the four M's and the T of KPIs. And um, the M's stand for meaningful measurable, manageable, movable, and then the T is time bound. So as you're putting together your metrics, as you're starting to design um, your, define your KPIs, really ask yourself, um, you know, do they align with the values of your organization? Um, are your customers getting value out of your product? Are you getting meaningful information from understanding your user's journey? So. That's what those um, meaningful metrics are referring to. Um, measurable me metrics refer to, you know, really, can you quantify it? Can you can you really measure it? Um, manageable metrics and KPIs refer to your ability to really um, not only control but develop initiatives to improve this metric. Um, Movable metrics and KPIs um, are essentially just not too stable, right? Are they action oriented? Can you actually have an impact on this KPI? And then finally, making sure that um, it's time bound, um, that there are that they are tracked in a time sensitive way. Um, one of my favorite examples that I always um, give for time bound metrics would be, um, let's say, engagement in a um, social media app versus a banking app. So as you can imagine, a social media app like a TikTok or Twitter, you're looking at daily engagement, right? Definitely weekly engagement, daily engagement, potentially even hourly engagement, right? So how frequently are your users using that product um, per hour or per day? Right? How frequently are they coming back um, in a day? Um, on the other hand, if you're analyzing your um, banking app um, and engagement on a time basis, or uh, or sorry, on a weekly basis, or a daily or hourly basis, your results are probably not going to be very um, accurate. Right? Um, essentially. Um, users who use a banking app would probably um, use it, what, about once a month, um, perhaps, um, perhaps weekly at most, uh, but definitely not hourly, right? So making sure that you're tracking those KPIs um, with that um, time sensitive aspect um, in mind um, is definitely one of the best practices that we that we recommend um, following. Um, over time, we've, you know, also seen a plethora of customer metrics and KPIs, some of which we wouldn't always necessarily call the most insightful. So we wanted to highlight some of those metrics that you might want to avoid um, and how you can actually transform them into impactful metrics instead. So First, we have um, vanity metrics and vanity metrics um, don't necessarily correlate to the numbers that really matter, right? So they may even make you look good in presentations, but they don't necessarily help you understand how your performance, um, they don't help you understand your own performance in a way that informs future strategies, right? So for example, um, what we see here is, you know, seeing numbers of visitors, um, number of downloads. And what we recommend instead is opting for value metrics. Um, so combining, what we mean by that is really combining some of these actions with um, another key step or another key, you know, value moment. So for example, um, did they not only visit your page, but what else did they do? Um, one great example that I always love giving for vanity metric is time spent, right? So let's say you're tracking um, time spent on your web app and um, you know it looks like they spent 
24 minutes, which may be great if you're, you know, on average, people spend 10 minutes on your website. Um, let's say that instead what, or, you know, that what actually really happened was someone opened your site, um, then they left to go do something else. And, you know, they really didn't get anything out of that session. And you're now looking at this 24 minute session thinking, wow, this is a great metric. Um, and of course, you know, um, that's just a, a simple example, um, you know, looking in the, the grand scheme of data and things. Um, it's, you know, one single data point, but really just to, to, to give the visual here. So what you would want to do potentially want to do instead is see not only the time spent on your site, but then um, link that with a key action that you want them to perform, right? So let's say you have a CTA within your site, or let's say that you have, you do have um, a, a valuable um, document that you would want them to download. So, you know, did they spend time plus did they do this other activity that gives them and provides your users with value? So that's um, an example of going from vanity metric to value metric. Um, another example is um, lagging indicators. So lagging indicators really refer to output metrics, right? Um, whereas leading indicators, on the other hand, really help you anticipate and predict um, what will happen. So revenue, for example, um, that is an output metric. Um, on the other hand, you can track, for example, um, average number of orders per user, right? Um, so monthly or over time, as you're tracking your metrics, you can get a sense of, you know, is that average going up? Is it down? Um, which way are you are you trending? Um, now, also just to be clear, that's not to say that revenue is not an important metric. Um, that's not the case at all. Um, again, just really thinking specifically in terms of product analytics and really understanding how your users engage with your product, right? So we can see how revenue would be an output, um, a lagging indicator versus, um, you know, average order per user, order size, um, and so forth. Um, third, we have here manipulatable metrics, which are essentially any metrics that you can easily manipulate. Um, again, you can include them um, in your in your. You you should definitely be keeping an eye on these. Um, but having, for example, your customer satisfaction score as the one metric that really matters um, is probably something that we would advise. Um, towards having a CSAT as potentially a secondary um, metric within your framework, right? So definitely keep an eye on them, but um, it shouldn't be your number one um, metric that really matters, right? And then finally, we have um, summary metrics, which are, you know, single action static snapshots of product usage. Um, and again, all of these are important for getting a, a summary of digital health. But if your goal really is to have long term customers who get enough value out of your product um, to keep using it, um, keep coming back, recommend their friends, then those metrics are just not enough. Right. And that's where these growth metrics um, really come in. Um, so I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into how you can transform your summary KPIs into growth KPIs. And the key here is really to combine the value moment that your product provides with a natural frequency. So as we can see here, for example, um, growth KPIs are more nuanced, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. So it really takes incorporating multiple dimensions, um, including time and a series of behaviors. So instead of, for example, only looking at how many people ordered food or how many orders um, were placed, you can track who the power orders are, right? So um, we can look at the people who placed three orders in seven days. Who are those power orders? Um, instead of just seeing, for example, um, you know, who opens your, your banking app, you can see who makes three or more transactions in a week or in a month, really. So um, it's really, again, uh, marrying those value moments that your product um, provides with a, a natural frequency um, 
and time bound aspect of your product. So, um, you know, really we see here that establishing an analytic strategy really helps align various teams um, and stakeholders towards a shared vision for product development and execution. Um, as you start designing your analytics um, strategy, my last recommendation here is really to involve your team. Get your team involved in the creation of the focus metrics so they can really feel, um, really feel invested um, and um, secondly, you know, start small, really start by choosing a product or product area that you know really well and start there. Again, remember that having too many metrics can be um, just as, um, you know, useless as having no metrics at all. So definitely keep that in mind. Um, and, you know, we know I we covered a lot of guidelines today, a lot of best practices, but it's really important to keep in mind how you can turn this into a meaningful um, action, right? So I encourage you all to evaluate different frameworks out there and start designing your own product analytics strategy. So with that, thank you all. And I hope you continue to enjoy the rest of the conference.